Hello everybody and welcome to today's lecture. I'm Adam Steele and this is Hot Pole Studios and today we're going to be talking about audio for music production with ADAT, MADI, whatever that is, PCI, PCI Express and Thunderbolt, whether anything's better or worse than anything else. And we're going to be taking all this apart and rebuilding it in a way that is significantly different. So stay tuned. So let's start from the start. This is going to be quite a long video with a lot of talking. Uh, this is kind of going to be in the format of a video of a, a YouTube channel like Tech Tangents. Uh, so if you're expecting something short and you're going to put in the comments, oh, this guy talks a lot, this is the format of that kind of video. So sorry about that in advance, but this is going to be educational, hopefully. This is my studio computer. This is a monster. It's not quite state of the art, but it's pretty close. Um, let's start with that and then we'll go on to all of this. So this is fairly modern. This is a motherboard with an AMD 3900X 12 core processor. That's only just now two generations old and is more than powerful enough to handle a full mix of whatever I can throw at it which is wonderful. And usually in this configuration, I've been using it with the RME HDSPE RADAT card as my main kind of go-to uh, interface. I say interface, let's go back even further because you'll see interfaces like this. This is an old audience ID for Mark I. This is an audio interface. But what is an audio interface when you break it down? This is where it gets kind of complicated and people don't really understand uh, why a big recording studio can be so complicated. So this interface is actually three things bundled into one. It has a microphone preamp inbuilt, which can take really quiet microphone signals because they are really quiet from an electrical standpoint and bring them up to line level, which is a nice reasonable voltage, or there's a DI on the front direct injection, which does a very similar thing, but usually with guitar signals, but other things as well. Then that has to be converted to a digital signal. So in here is also an analog to digital converter. And then there is also a third piece, which is the bit that I consider to be actually the interface. So that's a chip or a series of chips that are connected to some sort of communication, in this case USB, and by connecting that to the computer and installing software drivers, that bit talks to your software, whether it's Pro Tools, Reaper, Logic, whatever it is that you use, and makes the whole thing communicate as fast as it reasonably can so you don't have much latency. And then those signals that come back get converted digital back to analog inside here, and then put out of either the monitor outputs or the headphone amplifier. So this does a lot, but this small little thing only has two inputs and two outputs. In a recording studio where we do all sorts of mad things all at the same time, we need things to be much more robust and much bigger. Some studios you'll see something like a UA Apollo, or you might see some more bespoke setup. I've gone one further onto the RADAT. So this is what I've been using for a long time because this card goes straight into the computer. There's no USB, there's no middleman. This essentially goes straight to the CPU with the audio, nothing in between, and gets it back. But this doesn't have the digital to analog or analog to digital converters, and it doesn't have the microphone preamps either. Now that's what I've got a lot of this kind of stuff for. I like to pick and choose what preamps I'm using depending on whether I want a modern sound, a vintage sound, whether I'm sending that into other equipment like compressors, all that kind of stuff. Then that gets sent into something that's in this rack. A lot of these are analog to digital converters. I've got some RME ADI 2s in there. 
I've also got an Audient ASP880 in there, which does have preamps, but can also be used just as converters and then something from Focusrite as well. And I'm looking to expand it and integrate it all. Now, all of those convert the signal into digital and they tend to send their signals, most of them, through optical cables to here. And this uses what's usually called ADAT. It's technically incorrect as a term. This is ADAT. This is an Alesis ADAT machine because ADAT itself is actually a format where you've got a VHS tape, you know, the big black things, although a special version of them, an SVHS. You stick that in and that will record eight channels of audio on that tape at either 44 or 48 kilohertz and then play them back and then transport that over optical back to wherever it's got to go. That machine also has analog in and outputs because it's from the era where that was more common, but it also has the optical in and out, which is actually called TOSLINK. This is an old digital standard that is often called SPDIF as well, but that's also technically incorrect because ADAT as a format and SPDIF as a format can both be sent down a TOSLINK cable. And you can see these things. A lot of modern interfaces still have optical connections, but they are the TOSLINK style of, of optical connector. And that's great because that means that a lot of the time, if I've got a separate preamp, like a separate preamp bank, should I say, with converters in, like the Audient ASP880 that's back there, that can use eight microphones, turn them into line level, and use that optical connection to send that audio over to here. And so because of the way that this system works with the RME system, this actually has an expansion board that comes with it. And these two together have eight of these ADAT cables, optical cables. And that means at 44 or 48 kilohertz, four of those are in and four of those are out. So if we times that by four, we get 32 inputs and 32 outputs. That's amazing. And this card can also do a couple of extras using the AES standard and the coaxial SPDIF standard, which is the non-optical version with the same actual digital signal, but just over a, a non-optical cable. So that will do 36 in and 36 out. That's amazing. And a lot of these USB interfaces, like I was saying before, USB can be a problem if we want really low latency. And low latency is something that a lot of big studios we really crave because it means that we can use a lot of plugins and do some real CPU hungry horsepower stuff whilst recording and have that go back out of the headphone outputs or the speaker output so we can hear it and the vocalist, drummer, whoever can hear all that processing done in essentially real time where the latency is short enough that they don't notice it and it's short enough that a professional musician their ear can just kind of adjust to it and we can have as well as the wonderful analog outboard gear clever plugins that either don't exist in analog or more than I happen to own in that rack can all be done at the same time and again that's amazing and recently I've started to hit a couple of limits and this is where this all comes in now, I kept saying that each one of these on ADAT can do eight channels at 44 or 48 kilohertz. Now, why did I keep saying that specifically? It's to do the thing called bandwidth, because there is a thing that you can do with these called SMUX. Now, SMUX is very clever. I started recently working in 96 kilohertz uh, with a lot of my projects. Do I think it sounds better than 48? Probably not, but there are other reasons I'll get into that in a different video and I've just decided to go down that road. So let's just accept that for now and say, okay, that's what I'm doing. Let's say I've been sent a project by somebody who's been working in 96. We can debate that later because I found it works for me, but I'm not some crazy evangelist. Anyway, the problem is when you go to a 96 kilohertz mode, these can only fit four channels of audio down each cable. 
that becomes a problem because as a big studio, I might need more channels than I have now. It's been divided. Uh, the SPDIF and AES on here can run two channels each at 96K. So if we do the maths, four times four plus two plus two means I get 20 in and 20 out. Now that really is pushing the limits. And so I started doing some research because something that I've known for a long time is a thing called MADI. Now, sorry, I keep doing this thing where I get lower and lower. Yeah. Uh, MADI, which is what this card has, is a different audio standard, M-A-D-I for MADI. And MADI is very cool and I think was used a lot in live sound, but that's one of those, you know, citation needed kind of things that it's not been incredibly popular. It seems to have kind of fallen by the wayside. Not every big audio interface supports it. Not every audio manufacturer supports it, but it has some serious benefits. Whenever this was introduced, Maddy, uh, they thought about it and they come as pairs in and out. And on a pair of Maddy at 44 or 48 kilohertz, you can have 64 inputs and 64 outputs at the same time. That's a lot. Now, this particular card from RME again is the Hammerfall DSP Maddy. And this, you can either use their optical connection, which is not an ADAT optical connection. It's what's called multi-mode fiber or you can use BNC 75 ohm cables for a coaxial connection. And one of those can be active at a time, but it'll do 64 inputs and 64 outputs. That's a huge amount. Or if we're running at 96 kilohertz, which is what I want to do, it will do 32 in and 32 out on the cables. And here's the clever thing. RME let me use both at the same time time. So this is where the party really gets started. This is where we start getting onto the conversation of the thing I was saying about PCI, PCI Express and Thunderbolt, because this is where it all gets a little dicey. Um, most, in fact, probably all of the modern computers that we see now with modern motherboards have loads of connectors on that are PCI Express. Now, PCI Express is kind of an evolved, upgraded version of the older PCI. This RME MADI card is PCI. I didn't know that when I got it off eBay. Whoops, my fault. Uh, but the way this works, it's got loads of pins on the bottom. You can see those pins there, loads, those gold contacts. PCI works in a parallel fashion and sends loads of data in one direction, and then as far as I know, it then takes more in the other direction. So it kind of goes in, out, in, out, in a parallel kind of way. That connector also powers the thing and does all the other stuff that's needed so that the computer knows what it's dealing with. And then of course the drivers do the rest. But modern computers don't have that connection uh, because it was replaced with PCI Express, which is what this RADAT card is, RADAT, ADAT, so yeah, you'll see there's a much smaller, there we go, if we can get it in focus, much smaller connector. So this big one here is actually the power and all that kind of associated stuff. And then this tiny one, that's the data, that's it. But this is where it gets clever because PCI Express, what they did with it is you can have a number of lanes as they called it. So PCI, the old one, this converts down to one lane which is why this has a tiny little thing on, because these are roughly equivalent with each other. When you see a lot of graphics cards, they have this really long connection on that kind of is about that wide. And that is a times 16 connection. That is actually 16 of these tiny little fingers next to each other. So you can send 16 lots of data at the same time, which for something like a graphics card, which needs huge amounts of data transfer, that's exactly what they need. But for audio, as much as we think audio is big, it's really not. I mean, if you think about, I did the calculations and let's do it again at 48 kilohertz. So 48,000 hertz times 24 bit is 1.15 megabit. 
and then let's times that by the number of channels that are coming in on here, which is 64. That is 73.7 .7 megabit, not megabyte, megabit per second. So probably more like seven or eight megabytes a second when we adjust for overhead. And PCI, the old PCI, can do 100 megabit one way and 100 megabit the other way. So this is quite comfortably with 64 in and 64 out, not even breaking a sweat on one PCI lane. And it's, it's very much the same with any sort of audio communication. That's on the 6464 Maddie. So where the RAID at is actually 3636, that's not even breaking a sweat. Now, where it gets really cool for us is that PCI Express doesn't share a bus. Like the old PCI, you would have every card in the system that's connected to the PCI bus would be kind of vying for communication time. So that would be difficult, but with PCI Express, you can have each one in its own lane. And as long as the CPU has enough of these PCI Express lanes available, each one can have its own lane and you can stack these as many as you like. Now, RME are a very clever company that, by the way, this isn't sponsored by RME. They have no idea I'm doing this. Uh, it's not sponsored, uh, but they have written the drivers for these so that you can have multiple of these running at the same time which is what we're going to do. Now, this is where it gets a little difficult because this Maddy card is PCI, but I got an adapter from StarTech. Which I'll try and get that in focus. And this thing has the big white connector, which is PCI, and the tiny little PCI Express. So I'm going to chunk these together now. And suddenly that is the card for Maddy. And it's, it's massive. It's too big and doesn't fit in the computer. It's a, an ugly mess of a thing. And so this is where we come to today's experiment because a lot of these, these are expansion cards, daughter boards that clip through RME's kind of proprietary connectors on the top here. So we're only actually dealing with two cards, but also we've got the graphics card that's got to fit in here as well. All these extra things have got to jam into this case. So we said no, and I got this. This is a case, but it's an open air case. It's, it's kind of a Bitcoin mining rig case. We're not gonna be doing any Bitcoin style mining or anything like that, but because that market has essentially crashed, I got this, which is basically just a frame where these all kind of sit above the computer. And because of that, this is super cheap. I got this for 10 pounds. It's like, what, $12? Because there's no market for it anymore. So what we need to do is get all the bits out of this case and put this together. Now this isn't going to be the most pretty computer that I've ever built, that is for sure. But it's going underneath the desk so I'm not really bothered about that because aesthetic is a wonderful thing, but here would actually be a hindrance rather than a help. I do have loads of zip ties, so I'm probably gonna zip tie some of these bits away as well. But we'll get there when we get there. There we go. Now we've still got the power cables connected, so they can come out one by one. And I'm gonna have to get that USB header somewhere at the front to make my life easy. But if anything, keeping a computer in a case for audio production, for me, is kind of inconvenient. Because a lot of the time, I need to be able to get to components very quickly. Uh, like if, if there's a, a dropout, maybe a cable's come loose. I don't want to be kind of dipping down the back of my console and having to crawl around. So having all these PCI cards risen up above might actually help me quite a lot. But yeah, I need to take out the power supply. 
to which I've installed an extra Molex cable, which I'll talk about briefly in a second. I'm also stealing this uh, USB breakout. I might have uh, another USB breakout somewhere that might mount quite nicely to this new rig, but I've not even seen the new rig yet, so I don't want to speak too soon on that front. Ah! All right, let's get rid of this. All right, let's see what's in this case. Just, no, that's not quite everything. There we go. Okay. So this, this is what I end up with. And let's see how this goes together. Oh, it's got a little foam pad, that's nice. That'll be a good electrical insulator. A uh, whole pack of cables. Why does it say cables? Whole load of screws. Now, what could be interesting is that a lot of mining rigs would have low profile CPU coolers so that you could fit more GPUs over the top. Now, in our case, it's very much the other way around that we don't want uh, a tiny CPU cooler because most of the work done in audio production is CPU based, at least in current day. How wide is that? Oh, that doesn't fit down there. That could be interesting, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it because I'll probably have it sat sideways down there, uh, which means that, yeah, we'll cross that bridge in a second. But yeah, with this being quite wide, if I make a plan now to have all the audio cards on one side, and all the graphic stuff kind of nearer the front of the computer where it doesn't need to be touched. That could work out quite well. But yeah, the third part of this puzzle, what's in here? Okay, motherboard standoffs, zero screws. Ooh, a power switch, that's useful. Um, I did order a nice pretty power switch, which is longer and is going to come up and kind of sit on the desk that lights up, uh, but that didn't arrive yet, so that's going to happen. Right now I've got this horrible kind of clicky power button, which it just serves a purpose. I mean, most, most of that kind of stuff is aesthetic. A lot of gamers have their rig out on show and that kind of thing. We're not doing that. But let's have a look at how the flippity flop this goes together because this will have to go on one of these sides and yes it's actually safer for, I think for me to carry the computer by the CPU cooler because it's heavier than the rest of it is so there's actually less stress on the board by picking it up from there but back to where I was uh, there's some screws here which means that the power supply goes on one of these sides Right, at this point, I'm going to cut the cameras, put this together, and we'll be back in a minute. Right, so I got the frame together and I got the PC into the frame. And as you can see here, I decided the, because of this big, great CPU cooler, there's supposed to be a bar that goes kind of down the middle here, which can support things like graphics cards. But... This is the only heavy card is the GPU. So what I'm actually going to do is put that in the second GPU slot. 
and we're going to use some of these things, which are PCI riser, PCI Express risers to get these cards mounted up at the top. So what these do, I've got a couple of them, is they take a tiny little adapter thing that goes in the slot. They use what is essentially a USB 3 cable. <clears throat> it's definitely not USB protocol, but it's just a cable that happens to have nine cores. So I think that's enough to take the data. Definitely not enough to take power. So I'm gonna have to power these, but they do have uh, Molex connectors on them, which is useful because I have a Molex connector attached to the power supply right here. So I can send power, not through the motherboard, but separately, and then data goes where it's gotta go. So the graphics card is taken care of. That only has one HDMI plugged into it usually anyway, uh, because I use a 4K screen there, so that's done. So let's look at assembling all this because this is where it gets tricky because like this Maddy card, move that over, is already on this green uh, PCI to PCI Express bridge and that's gonna go on one of these ugly things and that becomes this absolute Frankenstein and needs powering from two separate uh, ports, I think. Yeah, it will do because that'll have to power the uh, the riser. So that whole thing, look at that for a Frankenstein, that can probably go on this side over here. Luckily, none of the cards that I need to install, like I was saying, are heavy uh, because the, the whole thing about this middle strip here was supposed to support the weight of graphics cards and none of these are graphics cards, which helps us tremendously because that means that I can get a screw on here and that whole monster, let's see if I can spin, yeah, so that whole thing there is gonna be supported and I might just put the Radat one across here on the other side of the graphics card because of uh, size, because these daughter boards are only tiny. These can go in front of the CPU cooler, I think, yes in front of the CPU cooler with no physical contact, which means that there's no electrical contact. Uh, because the third expansion that I've got for the Radat is the word clock module, which means that I can keep all my digital stuff in sync. Very, very necessary. Very necessary. Let's put it that way. So let's get my screwdriver and start installing things. Ooh. Yeah, with, th with this being an audio only computer and not being, I guess that's the wrong size screw. Yeah, with this being audio only and not being uh, a video production machine, uh, the graphics card that I've got in here is a passive GeForce 1050, no, yeah, 1050 Ti. And the 1050 Ti uh, doesn't need a fan, doesn't need uh, an extra power supply cable which helps keep things nice and neat. All it needs is its PCI Express connection. And that's it, which means it's nice and neat and tidy. All right, what I think I'm gonna do is get this screw about halfway in. It's typical cheap Chinese metal work and tolerances are absolutely terrible, but it does what we need it to do. Oh, by the way, everybody, make sure that you are all you know, anti-staticked up and all that kind of stuff. There we go. So that's now going to get lots and lots of anti-static treatment, as is this one. Right, let's just... Oh, that's a little close electrically. There we go. That's, that's the one where there's no electrical connection. Perfect. All right. So I'm putting the main two cards... Uh, above their relative PCI Express times one sockets, and then I'm gonna run the expansion boards in some of the other slots. It's not gonna be the prettiest build, but it should be quite practical. There we go. 
So yeah, like I was saying, this this little PCI times one PCI Express times one thing goes in this little slot down here, which is close to the graphics card, but is not touching. And this cable comes around here and plugs in there. There we go. Now you can technically do that with a graphics, graphics card and that's how Bitcoin miners did it because they didn't need the full 16 lanes of communication. They only needed one. And so I'm going to go and grab another riser from upstairs for the Radat one, which is going to be less ugly, but still not entirely pretty. Back in a second. I return with another one of these. So these are going to be held on by gravity, which is not the ideal situation. And that, there we go. Setup isn't ideal there, so I'm going to move this one over and use the fact that these uh, cables on the bridges are quite long to my advantage. There we go, much, much better. Happier with that, that's significantly safer. So I'm going to run the Radat expansion board. Right next to it, yep. And then the word clock. I am going to move over closer because I'm probably going to end up syncing word clock between the two this way. Also, if anyone's terrified of me uh, putting electrical components on metal, there is absolutely no electrical current going through anything right now. Everything's been properly ESD discharged. Then nothing is plugged into the mains. There is nothing that could cause any electrical issue, he says. There we go, so all my word clock is further on. So if I just focus the camera, you can see I've got all my ADAT there, word clock's there. The MADI word clock is gonna be pretty close to that. Is that the one? Does that fit? Yeah, that fits there. Because what I'm probably gonna do, seeing as though the, uh, one of the things about these cards I should probably mention is even though you can run them both in software at the same time, they are still considered by the hardware to be completely separate units from each other. So to synchronize them in case I do end up sending any audio from one to another, which I don't know how I would, but let's keep things simple. I am going to have them connected by a small BNC cable so that they are in sync. There we go. And you can see I've got uh, my uh, word clock on the ADAT. I've got a word clock on the MADI and then the actual MADI card is back here. So we've got now a full complement of everything. And this computer has become an absolute monster. So I need to connect another USB, not USB, PCI Express, come on. I keep wanting to say USB, so I'm gonna use this particular connector over here, move that delicately round to this USB shaped hole. And that fits nicely. And now, where's the computer gonna be? It's gonna be back into the right, I think, in terms of computer. So I need this little unit to go over here, because that's got USB, so I can stick things like my iLock in without any great inconvenience. Anyway, we'll cut back here in a minute when everything is plugged in and turned on. 
There we go, quickly before I turn it on. See, I've got my keyboard and mouse and it's all plugged in, but still off. So we've got the Radat with its expansion here and its word clock extension here. We've got the MADI over here, got the MADI all the way over here with its word clock extension over there. Word clock is important, everybody, uh, because word clock means that we can have everything in the studio synchronized together. And I'm going to make the Radat the master because it's got two uh, word clock out. So one can feed the other card and the other one can go up to any particular devices that need to be synchronized. Now, I'm going to switch. I've got a little screen here, so I've been able to see what's on this camera. I'm going to switch that over to here. And then at the first available opportunity, I'm going to get some screen capture software going so that you can see what I see. This is where I have to hope that I've got all this wired correctly, but it looks right to me. Everything's relatively neat. Nothing's been tied off yet. Let's go. No explosions. RGB lights on the motherboard. On. Got red light there, yellow light there, green light there, and I can see some optical glowing off of the toss links over there. And I can see that it is loading. Fantastic. Which means that the graphics card works in the not number one slot, which makes me happy. All right, so we're running, You well, usually we're running in 4K, so I'm running in 1080, so everything looks hilariously big. But if I bring up my DSP window, running in 96K, I can see one of these cards, but not the other. Now, I can see optical lights on the, uh, on the radar, which means that PCI X1 underscore one, the one that it's currently plugged into, uh, must be one that is shared with something else so it doesn't like it. I'm gonna have to change something around. It says word clock is locked. That's good, that's great. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> um, that's with, without the radar, we are not finished. But yes, um, I will show you more very shortly. All right, now that I've restarted, I have the uh, software up. I moved the uh, PCI bridge from one port to another, uh, which now technically shares with the graphics card, but that's fine because it means the graphics card just uses eight lanes, which we're not doing any gaming or computing or Bitcoin mining with it, so that doesn't matter. And so I can now see on screen here, I've got in the Hammerfall DSP, Maddy 1, and Radat 2. Now, they're both running at 96K. I'm gonna change the card order so that Radat hit apply. Right, so the Radat is number one and the Maddie is number two. And so, uh, that because that's the order I've always run, uh, the Radat's always been the main card. So the routing that I have, that I use in Reaper, is gonna stay the same and then more channels will just come after what I had previously may turn out to be a, a poor decision. I'll, I'll mess around with that later. Because one of the things that I've been thinking about, here's one of the issues with with uh, ADAT, is because it's eight channels per optical, when you go up to 96K, four channels are missing, so it just kind of shoves the next four channels into the channel listing so that all your routing is kind of messed up, whereas, on the MADI, if I go from 48K, say, with 32 channels in on a 64 channel bus and then turn it to 96, so I've got 32 channels, they should all stay in, they should all stay in the same order. So maybe I should do it that way around, but that's gonna change and mess up everything that I, I had previously in the setup. Now, that is awesome. Uh, I have, let, let's just for fun, change it all to 48K and 48K. There we go. So I've set it so that the Radat has its clock source internal and that little word clock cable that I had running there is going to the input, so the word clock source on the MADI. So that's now locked. So those two now, those two cards are working perfectly in sync with each other. So let's hit OK and you'll be able to see here if I change the zoom so that it's not all just blocked out, the uh, Radat on 48K goes up to 
32 and AES and speed diff and all that good stuff. And if I change this to MADI, that's where it goes crazy because now that can see 64 channels in and 64 channels out and that's insane. If I open Reaper, it's probably going to moan at me about some missing plugins because I'm not plugged in my iLock. But if I change this to 48,000, I can hit OK and then go into the list and just choose all of these channels. And here's the really bonkers thing. I've got it set to a nice generous 256 sample latency. So in fact, let's run that at 128. There we go. So oh, DSP, well, let's change both the buffer sizes to 128 and they've changed together. That's great. There we go. So at 2.7 and 3.3 milliseconds in and out, which is much more accurate than a lot of the other DAWs will tell you because it takes the round trip latency into account. I now have 100 channels in and 100 channels out. Now, nothing's currently connected to the MADI, so what was the point of that? Well, this is where this comes in. Ah, oh, because this is the next part of the puzzle. This is an old AM713 from Euphonics. Now, Euphonics are now part of Avid. So, you know, the people who make Pro Tools. I don't know if they always were, but this thing is a beast and has 32 analog channels going in and one MADI cable going out. So that's where this thing will run at 96 kilohertz and still do 32 analog to MADI. And because of this setup, all my other ADAT stuff will continue running. So I can have outboard looped through this thing and I don't currently have a, a digital to audio going the other way yet, but I'll keep an eye out for that. Let's get this plugged in and make sure this works because I've not actually plugged it in yet. Oh, she's noisy. And currently running at 48 as well. Uh, there is an auto mode on here in terms of the sync. I need to get two BNC cables. Found one. Now, I think the reason that Maddie uses either BNC or multi-mode optical is so you can send these signals a very long way. I think the this was originally kind of the in intended for live sound use where you could use a digital snake that used Maddy. I'll go to Maddy in at the top and hopefully that little error light will go out. Oh, error light went green. Amazing. So let's use the mouse. Let's look at our DSP. Maddy lock, Maddy sync. Perfect. So that means that I think if I get a track going in Reaper, going from, and this is where we have to look down our massive list of channels now, HDSP Maddy one, live monitoring, and I'll see if I've got some sort of cable that I can do something with. Because of, of course this is not supposed to be microphone level. But if I plug something into, because this thing's got all these connections at the back. Perfect. So I plugged a microphone in. There's no preamp obviously, so it would sound terrible. And I would have to really, hey, hey, to get minus 30 out of it. But it's doing it. So if I go, hey, hey. There are some little controls on here so I can set it to like really hot analog levels so that I can have it uh, work. But that is, uh, you know, three milliseconds of input latency. I've got a hundred channels going. So if I change this to 96K and then the hundred channels is not going to be right. So let's open that back up and then go to let it re numerate the channels and change this to Maddy one again. Hey, there we go. So at 96 K roughly the same round trip latency, it doubled the sample buffer so that we got the same latency and I could have 32 channels running through this noisy little thing 
which I might only have turned on while I'm mixing or if I'm using outboard and I've got a loud, loud band because that's a lot. But I, I don't have to rely on this for everything and I'm still looking for upgrade paths. Because here's another thing, not every, not every audio manufacturer makes interfaces with MADI on them, but several do. Antelope Audio do, I know that for a fact. Uh, their Orion 32 and all the versions after that have MADI in and out, and I believe in their mixing software I can route their analog inputs and outputs straight through MADI. So that's what I'm wanting to do in the future because um, even though a lot of their interfaces use Thunderbolt, I don't particularly trust Thunderbolt. It is PCI Express plus some other stuff over a cable, uh, but then you need a Thunderbolt uh, specific architecture of your computer. And I mean, at that point we're going back to Mac and I don't mind Mac stuff. I really don't. I mean, I use a, uh, a MacBook Air for my portable productions, uh, but this kind of Frankenstein setup is very me. And this means that everything I could possibly imagine I can now do in the studio. And let's talk prices for a minute. Because like the modern RME MADI, the, uh, the PCI Express MADI card, we're looking at 1200 pounds, 1200 euros, $1,400 for that card. And I got this one for 400 instead of 1200 which I should have looked at the eBay listing closer because I didn't realize that it was the PCI, not the PCI Express version, which is what spurred this Frankenstein of a design on. But I'm okay with that because I've made this work and this is very me. And this 32-channel uh, converter from Euphonics uh, cost me about £500 on eBay, uh, which is a lot of money. It is. Uh, but having said that... Um, RME, as an example, make the M32 uh, AD, so it, which is basically this, but with slightly higher noise specs. And that, sorry, higher quality noise specs, lower noise floor. Um, that is something like three, three and a half thousand compared to the 400 for this. This is only analog to the digital converters. Uh, this is not the interface. Those are the interfaces. It's not the preamps. Those are the preamps. So, yeah, that's a lot of three and a half grand is a lot of money for something that is only converters, in my opinion. Um, there are companies that make stuff that's really nice, like Burl make their mothership, which is ridiculous. I think they make a Maddie version of that. But by the time that's fully loaded with all their transformer coupled uh, channels, you're looking at fifteen thousand uh, dollars for the setup that I would want. And I really don't have that money to spend. Um, this was me doing it on the cheap and it still nearly came to a thousand pounds Plus all the other gear that I already have acquired for the studio. So You know, it's it's not ideal but Once this is squared away and neatly tucked away in the the setup there I'm not gonna have to touch this again until maybe the next kind of ADAP preamp banks come from whoever or, you know, the, the next iteration of whatever companies want to send me. But as it stands, this is going to be monstrous because this is going to be, if I've got enough outputs on the ADAP stuff, I only tend to use 10 outputs at maximum anyway, uh, generally in a production session, two for the monitors and eight for four headphone mixes. Uh, so on my radar, that means I've got another, even at 96K, I've got another 10 outputs, which can go to outboard. And then that can molt and come back in here and still have, you know, 20 inputs from stuff going to either the radar or the MADI from the live room and also another 12 going to here. So I might just use this as the converters for what's coming live off the floor and then use all the radar stuff for kind of uh, looping through outboard gear uh, at the mix stage without having to repatch anything. Because that's the other things I don't want to have to repatch in the middle of sessions. That's part of the reason why uh, a lot of big studios with big consoles have the big consoles with more channels than you think you need. Why does any studio need like a 72 channel desk? It might be that you've got 32 channels of actual audio then you've got um, effects coming in, you've got parallel stuff coming in, you've got 
you know, other stuff happening on the desk without having to repatch or lose anything. So that's that's kind of why I've done this. So I hope you've found this interesting. I certainly have. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. And I'm Adam Steele, and this is insane. Thanks, all the patrons, for supporting me on Patreon. You've been wonderful. And thank you, everybody. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.